Now in developing computer games, there are a range of processes that you can go through and there are a range of models that are available to um, create computer games. Now I'm going to be taking you through a particular model developed by Brian Wynn, but there are many other approaches. But first aspect you should look at is the um, serious game design elements. Um, it's in a circle diagram in your course notes. And there you've got four main elements, um, the computer game itself, the accessibility, the working alliance in the game, and the learning and immersion processes in the game. So in terms of the computer game, you've got concepts such as fidelity, fantasy, exploration, companionship, and challenge. So just as we looked at Guy's um, elements of play and learning and we've looked at some of the elements of serious play there are a whole range of different things that you can incorporate into the design of your computer game these are just some but it also highlights aspects of accessibility particularly important for education um, where we want to ensure that all of our students or as many of our students as possible can access and engage with the game so some of the concepts here are around um, perceivable information, how you present information in the game, the instructions on how to play, the information that's needed to progress during the game, the information that's needed to succeed and do well in the game. And these can all be presented in different ways, sometimes explicitly, sometimes hidden away, sometimes provided externally. Uh, Minecraft, which has been a very popular game, uh, provided no instructions within the game itself and a lot of it was done through trial and error but also it developed an external ecosystem where players shared what they had learnt about how to succeed within the game how to build various objects and to do various activities within the game and that process of sharing and building up that knowledge base became part of the game itself, even though it was conducted externally to the actual game. So there are a range of different aspects that can be incorporated around gameplay, particularly in a classroom environment where it's much more controlled and constrained, and you can develop these elements associated with the game that aren't necessarily part of the game mechanics themselves. And we'll discuss that in more detail next week when we look at um, secondary worlds. So other aspects are around um, the operable interface, what elements can actually the player manipulate and change. Um, there's the understanding of the information that they um, gain and how robust and reliable that is. Do, if they follow the instructions, does that then lead to successful outcomes? Um, or do they have to find other information? Or sometimes is there misinformation incorporated? in order to improve the gameplay experience. There can be a whole range of different elements that you can incorporate into your um, game. But in particular, these elements are associated with serious game design. So it's game design for a specific purpose, uh, primarily around educational outcomes. Then you have the um, working alliance, which is the goals and the tasks and the, the bonds that are formed between various elements of the game, between the player and the game, or the player and the character that they represent within the game, between other players, if it's a multiplayer game. But you can also have bonds with locations or guilds or um, communities within a game, um, the, the whole range of different aspects. Sometimes you might have a companion, what called non-player character or non-player um, entity, that um, is generated by the computer and assists you in playing the game, but you build a strong emotional bond and relationship with that. Um, and that can be incorporated into the gameplay mechanics, such as having that character become lost or die and build those emotional arcs within the gameplay storytelling. And then you have the learning aspects, such as um, immersion factors, so making students feel as though they're part 
it's part of like a real world event if it's that sort of training or it's a fantasy environment they have suspended their disbelief and engaged with and again we'll talk about that next week um, whether it simulates part of real life is it something that students can relate to and engage with in terms of the gameplay elements associating those with real life elements um, does it have multiple different perspectives of engaging with the world or is it very um, uh, simple and one-dimensional and does it provide situational learning where learn learners are put in situations where they have to put in, into practice what they've learnt in order to overcome challenges and explore various elements of the gameplay. So these are some of the categories that you can consider as part of your game development. But now we're going to look at some particular mechanisms and a particular approach for designing your game. So it goes, normally game development goes through a range of steps. We have a, con, a conceptualization stage where we do a range of brainstorming and um, coming up with a theme and some content and goals and the constraints we have around what maybe the game has to be able to be played within 30 minutes of a classroom lesson or things of that nature. Then often we'll sort of trial those out in terms of some a little mock-up of a game and what's called play testing and then that will go into a more formal design phase where we look at the art artistry and visual elements of the game um, testing things out developing various objects that would be in the game particularly if it's a graphically intensive game the soundscaping or the, the music and the sound that would be in a game and that would then go through another round of play testing which would then lead eventually into production so in your case, we're going to go through a much more abbreviated process that generally you'll go through a pre-production, a production and a post-production stage. Now to assist you primarily in the pre-production stage, uh, coming up with ideas and building out the game mechanics, um, we're going to use a process which involves the methodology circle. Now you can see that in the course notes and you can um, download it and print it out and I encourage you to do so because that can then allow you to utilize uh, post-it notes to put onto it and ideally if you've got four different colors of post-it notes that will assist um, yellow blue green and reddish or maroon um, because what you, what you're going to do is lay out your game design around these four quadrants so there's four elements that you need to explore. Storytelling, gameplay, the user experience, and learning. And within each of those four quadrants, there are three layers. The innermost layer is the design layer. This is the area that where you have most control over, where you design out what's going to occur. So in Twine, you're designing the various options that the player has and decisions that they can make as they progress through the game. The next layer is the play layer. This is where the player makes decisions based upon the, the, um, what you've allowed them to do from the design layer. So making choices between different pathways, uh, choosing to go um, left or right, or choosing to go north, south, east or west, um, choosing to pick up the object or drop the object. And based upon their choices and the design layer mechanics, various things will occur. But then there's another layer, which is the experience layer. And this is the overall experience the player has in playing the game. The overall learning they're gaining, um, whether or not it's an enjoyable experience or confronting experience or challenging experience. And this is built up by the mechanics of the design and the player actions as they play the game. So it's different from just making the choices in terms of the middle layer, the play layer. It's the overall experience of the game. And you need to be thinking about how to construct each of those layers. Now to assist you with that, we have a series of card decks that will help as you answer the questions on each card to flesh out your game. So 
The process of doing this is to print out or lay out your four quadrants. Now, if you don't have a printer, you can just make up four quadrants and and the four layers, or so the three layers within each quadrant. And you're going to place the cards into those different layers or post-it notes, which have your responses to the cards into those four layers. Now, again, if you don't have the, a printer, you can just um, look at the cards online. Um, it's not as random and generative in terms of uh, creative processes as being able to select from the card decks randomly but it is still a mechanism you can go through but essentially then you go through each of the cards and you look at the question and you answer the question you write out your response to the question and you place it on a post-it note within that quadrant so worst case divide your desk into four um, representing the four quadrants and with some pieces of paper answer the questions and put them into those quadrants and into the three layers. So each quadrant should have three different sections where you can put your different ideas down. Now why this is important is that as you build up your answers to these various questions, you will see the relationships between the various elements, the various quadrants and the various layers within the quadrants. And that will then help you identify various commonalities and associations between those and improve your creative processes in designing your game. It also makes you address all of the various elements of game design and flesh out um, what can be achieved with your game. Now this process is designed to be iterative, to go through two stages. So there are two decks of cards. So you do it first with the first deck and you build out your game design um, by answering the questions and laying them out in the various quadrants. Take a photo of that or record that or go to another desk or um, area and then do the same process with the second card deck, which will have somewhat more complex questions. Some of them are the same, they're designed to be iterative, but they help you then address things at a deeper level than you would have done with your first go through so that's the idea of this game design process, which will then come up with a whole um, layout that will then assist you in making a much more effective um, game in terms of your desi design for your Twine game or any game that you're planning on developing, particularly educational games. Now to assist you with this, too, there is a glossary to look at or print out and look at or look at on screen. That will help explain some of the terminology used. And for those of you that don't have a strong educational background, I've also provided you with Bloom's Taxonomy, which is a framework of different um, concepts that you can incorporate in as educational outcomes, such as being able to analyze something or remember something or explain something. Um, and these can be built into your game mechanics as well, and the cards will assist you in um, guiding you in that process. So this technique provides you with a process to go through to come up with your game design and traditionally it would then be prototyped on paper and you would try it out on paper but in the twine environment that provides a prototyping environment and design environment in one so you can lay out your different ideas into your twine um, decision-making branches and try out your game um, in an interactive way in that respect without needing to go through a paper-based design process. If you are making other games then that may be more effective in trying them out on paper first and um, planning them out and then play testing and exploring how the game works uh, before you then progress to more complex stages such as uh, making a computer game or a board game or card game or whatever sort of game that you're developing. So try that out and share your game layout, your cards and your post-it notes and that onto Teams and we'll discuss in the tutorial how the approach can assist you or has assisted you in developing your Twine game um, and explore the affordances that it's um, been able to 
give you in increasing the depth and complexity of the game and of the learning that can be achieved by your game. And we'll discuss that in the tutorial.